Well, as we get started this morning, let's begin with a little bit of a quiz. How many of you have ever met somebody and they said to you, you know, my goal is five years from now, I want to be grossly overweight. You ever met anybody that said that? Nobody. How about this one? Have you ever met somebody that said, you know what, if I play my cards right, a year from now, I'll be a porn addict or an alcoholic or a drug addict. You ever met anybody that said that that was their goal? No. How about this? Have you ever met somebody that said, you know what, if I just really make some good, stupid decisions, which that's an oxymoron, right? But if I I just really make some some bad decisions here, man, I'm going to be a divorced within a year or two. Ever met anybody that said that that was their goal? No. My point is simply this. Nobody plans on making bad decisions. But here's what else we need to understand. Few people plan to make good decisions. That's why we're doing a whole series right now called Pre-Decide, where we're looking at how do we go about making better decisions for ourselves? Because none of us plan to get into these situations that oftentimes we find ourselves in, where life is falling apart and life just isn't working out the way that we wanted it to. But we've got to learn to become better decision makers. The truth of the matter is, we just simply aren't. We just don't make good decisions. And why? Well, we looked at that last week as we began the series. Oftentimes, we make the emotional decision. We allow our emotions to come in, and all of a sudden, now we're doing things or saying things or looking at things or eating things, consuming things that we never intended to do, but our emotions came in, and that's what took over. Now we're in a a really bad spot, a place that we don't want to be. And so that's why, again, in the series that's called Pre-Decide, what we're looking at is we have got to pre-decide on various things that we're going to do in our lives. You've got to have pre-decision. Now you're going, Gilbert, wait a second. Last week you said that every single day we make on average 35,000 different decisions. How could I possibly pre-decide all 35,000? Well, the truth of the matter is this. You don't have to. You don't have to make all 35,000 decisions beforehand. You just need to make sure that you've pre-decided on the major things or the things that really trap you or, or that tempt you. Those are the ones that you need to do. And then if you live by a certain set of values and you pre-decide on what those values are going to be, then you're going to be able to say, all right, actually most of my decisions I have to make actually filter through those values. And so here's the reason that it's so important that that we think this through. And I put it there on your outline. It's what we talked about last week as well. It's our sort of big thought for this entire series. But the quality of the decisions I make will determine the quality of my life. Remember that from last week? The quality of the decisions I make will determine the quality of my life. Let's try it. Hopefully you guys are awake this morning. Those of you online, you can type it in the chat. Let's all say it together. The quality of the decisions I make will determine the quality of my life. Our decisions are so, so important. And so that's why what we're looking at throughout this series is a set of six values that you can live out. And I'm wearing the same shirt as as last week. That this is what it's going to be. And by the way, some of you asked, are the shirts available? Yes, they are. You can, you can get them. Uh, but what we're going to look at over these six weeks is that I am. And last week, uh, we, we talked about sort of the, the, the beginning of how these all play together. But we're going to look through each one of these. Today, I am ready. And then we're going to look at I am consistent. And then I am devoted. And that I am generous. I am faithful. And that I am a finisher. If you live by these six values in your life and you predecide that this is who I am going to be, man, life is going to be so much easier. In fact, we talked about that last week as well. They're on your outline. When my values are clear, my decisions are easy. When you're very, very clear on each of these six things, your decision making is going to be so much easier. And so let's jump right into it. The very first one that I am ready. Now, let me ask you a question here this morning. How many of you ever given in to a temptation and then later on you regretted it? Come on, be honest. All right. Those of you without your hand up are liars. (laughs) But that's okay. You're in God's house and he offers forgiveness. (laughs) Now, we've all done that before, right? We've given in to temptation and we've regretted giving in to that temptation. 
And we beat ourselves up about it, and you know, I, I joked about it, but God does give forgiveness, but yet we don't want to continue to live that way, do we? We, we want to be able to overcome these things. And the reason that we so often struggle with temptation is we simply aren't ready for it. In other words, we had no plan in how we were going to respond to it. Look at what Jesus says, though, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. He says, keep watch and pray so that you will not what? So you'll not give in to? Yeah, you, you've got you've to be keeping watch. You've got to be praying. And then uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, he says this, be on what? Be on guard. Then he says, do what? Stand firm in the faith. He says, be courageous. And then he says, be strong. He's writing this in the context of temptation. So we have got to pre-decide that I'm going to keep watch. We've got to pre-decide that I'm going to be praying, that I'm going to be on guard, that I'm always going to be ready. Now, why is this so important? Well, there's two things I want to share with you. The first thing is this. Number one, Satan is coming for me. Did you know that? Satan is coming for you. Jesus said that Satan wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to steal from you. He's not your friend. You know, I hear people all the time go, I don't want to do this whole Jesus thing and the heaven thing. I'm going to go and party with the devil in hell. No, you're not going to be partying with the devil in hell. Hell is punishment for Satan. It's his punishment. And he knows that he cannot be saved. And so what he wants to do is make you miserable. He wants to drag you to hell with him so that you'll suffer that same punishment that he does. He wants to kill you. He wants to steal from you. He wants to destroy you. So we can't play around with this. Satan is coming for you. And Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and then into verse 11. He says, another reason I wrote you was this, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Listen, Satan is studying you. He, he knows you. He knows what's going to tempt you. He knows what's going to trip you up. It's his schemes that he has that he's coming for you. And so he wants you to disobey God. And he wants you to do things that are going to hurt other people. He's coming for you. That's why we got to be ready. The second reason we need to be ready is this. Number two, I'm not as strong as I think. I mean, the truth of the matter is a lot of times we think that we can handle much more than what we actually can. Again, look at what Paul writes, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. He writes, even if you think you can stand up to temptation, be careful not to fall. You know, oftentimes we end up saying things or doing things or looking at things or consuming things because we thought that we could handle it, but yet we can't. We grossly overestimate our ability to handle temptation. We overestimate our ability to stand strong. Now, scientists, they actually have a, a term for this. It's called restraint bias. That we have trouble restraining ourselves and that we, we think that we're going to be able to do better at restraining ourselves than we actually can. You're going, go can you give us an example? Yeah, I'll give you an example here. You're at work, you're on a diet, you know you're not supposed to be eating snacks and sweets and stuff, but it's somebody's birthday or it's a retirement party. And what has one of the coworkers done? They brought in a big old chocolate cake. You go walking by it there in the morning the first time, and you're like, nope, not me, not today, Satan, nope, not me, not going to do it. I know better. Second time you walk by, you are lovingly looking at it. <laughs> Third time, what do you do? You walk a little bit closer to it, and just so you can, <sighs> just, I'll just smell it. I'll just smell it. You know what happens, right? By the end of the day, you are covered in chocolate. And your coworker's going, you may want to like wipe, uh, like wipe a little away there. Why? Because you thought you could restrain yourself, but you just simply couldn't. It just didn't happen. Now, can any of you relate to what I just said? Maybe it's not chocolate cake, but can any of you relate to what I'm saying here today? The things that you know you shouldn't be doing, and you think, oh, yeah, I've got enough willpower. I won't give in to that, but yet you still end up doing it. Anyway, we underestimate just how much mental and physical and emotional and spiritual energy it's going to take to fight temptation. In other words, our willpower 
it, it wears out as the day goes on. We get fatigued. It's sort of like what we talked about last week with the, the, the uh, decisions, that we get overwhelmed with decisions and that our, 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 we just get wore out and we just give in to things. So it's the same way here with this restraint bias. And that's why it, it's very similar to last week that you can do good willpower all day long at work. You know, you didn't yell at the boss. Yay, me, right? And then, you know, you, you, you worked hard all day long. You were very disciplined all day long. You had the willpower to do it. Then you get home and you're just simply wore out. The restraint, oh man, you just, you can't do it anymore. And so you end up saying things that you shouldn't say or eating things that you shouldn't eat, or looking at things that you shouldn't have looked at, consuming things you shouldn't have consumed. Why? Again, because you're just simply wore out. Your willpower wanes as the day goes on. And one of the things we need to understand about willpower, that the more that we have to exercise willpower, the longer it's going to take for it to actually be replenished and come back again. And so again, Satan is coming for you, and you are not as strong as what you think you are. So that's why we've got to be ready. So what are we going to be by the end of this series? Hopefully, I am ready. ready. I am ready. You want to go over Help me. <laughs> how can I become more ready? All right, well, let's look at three things here this morning of how you can become ready. The first thing is this. I must move the line. You've got to move the line. Now, to help you to understand this one, let me uh, visually illustrate it for you. I got a piece of rope here, and this is the line. Let's uh, throw that down, sort of like that. All right. So on this side of the line, you're in God's will. Everything with, with God is good. On this side of the line, you're in sin. And so all of us say, hey, I, I want to be right with God. I want to know that when I die, I go to heaven. Everything's all, all good with God. But you know what our human nature is? Our human nature is, I want to be good with God, but I also want to be as close to the line as I, I mean, I'm going to be like right up against the line. So I know I'm going to heaven, but yet occasionally I can dip my toe into the things of the world. That's just, that's just how we are. How close to the line can I be and still be all right? Let me give you a very practical illustration of this one. I run into this when I do premarital counseling all the time. Guys especially, they go, all right, Gilbert, I'm a Christian now, and I know we're not supposed to have sex before marriage. So, Gilbert, how, how close to the line can I get there? What can I touch? What can I rub? What can I pat? You guys sitting there looking at me with your little holy uh, polished halos. or You know what I'm talking about. Come on. How close can I get? And still be all right. Maybe you, you just, just a yeah, little. We know that we're not supposed to be here. But yet that's where we want to live. What I'm saying is we have got to get away from that line because up close to the line, it's dangerous. It's a dangerous place to be. And it's, it's sort of funny because we don't do this with anything else in life. Uh, imagine you're driving down the road and there's like a, a three-year-old in the middle of the road. You don't go, I'm going to see how fast I can floor this thing and how close I can get to that kid without hitting him. I'm going to see how close to the line I can get. You don't do that. Why? Because you know that's dangerous. What do you do instead? You pump the brakes. You go, I need to get as far away as I can. Or how about this one? Imagine that you're going to fly across the country. And you're sitting there in the, the lounge waiting to get on your flight. And the pilot happens to be sitting next to you. And so you're idle chit-chat, and the pilot says, I'm so excited for today. And you're like, yeah, why's that? Well, I'm going to do something I've always wanted to do. I'm going to experiment. I've always wanted to see, can we have just enough fuel in the plane to just get us all the way across the country? In fact, hopefully, if everything goes right, we'll be like coasting in on fumes as we land in LA. How many of you are getting on that plane? 
None of you. Why? Because you realize this is dangerous. We're, it's too close to the line. So again, we do not do this in all other areas of life. Of How close can I get to danger and still be okay? But yet some, for some reason, when it comes to sin, we're like, all right, I still want to be right with God, but I want to be really, really close. We have got to get away from the line. Going, all right, go help me out with this one, right? What, what, what's that look like? How do, I, how do I get away from the line? Well, last week I, I said to you, you know, some of you, your, your thing is, and it's not necessarily maybe sin, but maybe you're a little too familiar with Amazon. That buy it now button, like it's your weakness. It's your temptation. You see things and boom, you just click that button. It's on your doorstep. If you are first name basis with the FedEx driver, you've got a problem, okay? <laughs> if you know about his wife and kids, he's spending a little bit too much time at your house. And so you've got to step away from that line because when you're, you're, you're right here and it's just like, click the button. And it's like, oh, I gave in the temptation again. I bought something else that I don't need with money. I don't have to impress people I don't even like. You got to get away. Get away from the line. And I mentioned to you last week, one of the things that you could do is say, all right, from now on, I'm going to wait at least three days. So if I see something, I'll wait at least three days until I actually click the button. Now, for some of you, that'll be enough. Some of you are like, no, nope, that's, <laughs> I'm still just going to wait three days and I'm just going to buy everything. So maybe for you to get even further away from the line, what you've got to do, have somebody that's a friend or in your life group, somebody that you really trust, you say, come over to the house. We're going to log into my Amazon account. We're going to go to the settings, into my profile. There's the little password. I'm going to look away. You create a brand new password. And now only your friend knows the password to your Amazon account. So now, in order for you to hit the buy it now button, they're actually going to have to do it for you. They're going to have to log into your account and buy it for you. Go on, go that, that seems really restrictive. That, that seems pretty extreme. Well, sometimes we have to do things like that. We, we need to get away from the line as far as we can. Because here's what happens with, with Satan. If we're living close to the line, Satan is smart enough that he doesn't go, boom, and just shove you. And all of a sudden you're like, ah, I'm on the wrong side of the line. You know what Satan does? He sees you living there. And he just sort of leans on you. Just gradually, just enough that he's leaning on you. And what you don't realize is over time, your willpower is giving out. Your strength is giving out. And he just keeps leaning and leaning and leaning. And the next thing you know, you look down one day and you're like, uh-oh, I'm not right. And so we, we've got we've to sometimes be extreme. We've got to get away from that line. I'll give you an example from my life, and I've shared this with you before. So when I became a Christian in 1993, God instantly delivered me of so many things in my life, so much sin. But you know the one thing that I struggled with was pornography. And it was an ongoing process to be able to kick that. And so I've come to understand about myself that if there's anything in life that's going to trip me up, it would be sexual sin. And so I have extreme, I don't live right up to the line because I know that I'm going to be weak at some point and I would step over. And so I have to be very extreme. So filters on the internet, accountability uh, partners on the internet. I don't meet with women alone. I don't drive in a car with a woman alone. See, I'm getting so far away from the line that if I do mess up even just a little bit, I'm, okay, I just messed up, but I'm still right with God. And I may have shared this story with you before, but my previous church, we were building a, a huge new building, and we had this lady that came in. Actually, she was from the uh, Harrisburg area, um, but she was coming in to help us with our signage, and it was like $30,000 worth of signage that we were putting in. So like, you know, a lot of signage, lots of decisions that needed to be made. And so she was there, and we were like trying to figure out different things. She's like, oh, I got to go to the Lowe's, you know, where's your Lowe's at? And I'm trying to explain it to her. She can't. 
uh, understand it. And this was like before like GPS was like, you know, really a good thing. And I said, come on, let's just, we'll run up to the Lowe's. I'll take you up. We get like a mile away from the church and I went, oh crap. I'm in a car alone with a female. Now you're going, well, that sounds sort of stupid. Yeah, it does. There's nothing inherently wrong with that by itself. But for my standards, I had messed up. But listen, it is so much easier for me to say to my wife, Lisa, I messed up today. I got in a vehicle with a female today than say, hey, I messed up and I slept with somebody. That makes sense? So you get as far away from the line as you possibly can. For some of you, here's another one. This isn't necessarily sinful, but some of you, you spend way too much time on social media. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you, you name it. You're just, you're on it all the time. And you know that it's not healthy for you. And again, it may not be that it's sinful. It's just not healthy for you. Did you know that if you have a, a newer uh, Apple product or a newer uh, Android product, that almost all of the smartphones today have a feature right in the phone that you can set up to say, here's my time limit for each app. So you could say, for me, 15 minutes of Instagram a day or 15 minutes of TikTok a day. That, that's all I want to be able to do. And so you set it up in your phone and right there it is. And so when you get on, you're able to scroll through and you're TikToking for 15 minutes or whatever. And then when 15 minutes are up, it will not let you back in the app until the next day. So again, maybe that's something that some of you need to do. What I'm saying is we have got to get away from the line. We've got to move the line. We've got to have boundaries for our lives. And David, he writes about this. Psalm 16, 6, he says, your boundary lines make my life pleasant and my future is bright. We've got to have these, these boundaries. And again, I know some of you are going, man, it, it just sounds restrictive if I do things like that. How many of you have either kids or pets? One of the two. All right, lots of you. Why do you have a fence in your yard? Usually it's because you want to keep your kids or your pets and or your pets safe. You realize that within the boundaries of your yard, within that fence, they can explore and be free and do whatever basically they want to do within there, and they're good. But if your pets or your kids get outside of the fence, now that's where it's dangerous. And so again, we've got to understand that boundaries are actually a good thing. They're a healthy thing for us. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to move the line. Number two, then, I must pre-decide to magnify the cost. You've got to pre-decide that I'm going to magnify the cost. Whatever it is that you're struggling with, I want you to think of the worst case scenario that could possibly happen if you continue giving in to that temptation. And then just continually think about that. I'll give you an example of this one. So this is many, many years ago. Not in this church. It was a previous church. But um, had a guy come in. We'll call him Fred for the sake of the uh, illustration here. So Fred comes in to my office for counseling. And Fred's wife had caught him looking at pornography. And for Fred, it actually had started as just like normal normal pornography, uh, I guess. You know, he was looking at, at naked women. But eventually, that didn't satisfy his needs anymore. And so he started looking at more and more and more and more extreme types of pornography to the point that he was now actually looking at homosexual pornography. So he was into guys. And she had caught him doing that and in the process found out that he was actually researching male prostitutes in that particular city because he was being tempted to actually go visit with a male prostitute. And she said, look, you have got to, you've got to go get some counseling. You need to get some help or we're done here. And so he came in and I'm talking to him about it and some of the things that I had done, you know, to, to help me to overcome it many years before. But then I had him do this. I had him magnify the cost. I said to him, Fred, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a notebook 
And I want you to write out, in the, before we meet next week, I want you to write out every single bad thing that could happen if you continue to look at pornography or if you continue to, to you know, pursue this path of going and seeing a, a male prostitute. And I kid you not, he came back the next week because he was serious. He did not want to lose his marriage. He came back the very next week. He had a notebook full of things that could happen. That I could lose my marriage. I could lose my job. I could go to prison. I I could get to the place where, like, seeing prostitutes, you know, I get an STD or HIV. Uh, You know, I could get to the place where I'm spending so much money on it that... I end up having to steal money, you know, from others in order to, to fund my, my obsession that I have. Uh, he talked about his daughters because he had two little daughters at the time. And he said, if we get divorced, my daughters, they may end up hating me. And maybe I won't be invited one day to their graduation. Maybe one day I won't be invited to their wedding. I won't be able to walk them down the aisle. And so he just had... I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things that he put into this notebook. And, excuse the the, the pun, but he scared himself straight. (laughs) He magnified the cost and he saw the danger if he kept going down the path that he was. Sin seems so fun, and it seems so, like, enjoyable, and, oh, it's not really going to hurt anything. And so, yeah, I'm just going to dip my toe in occasionally, and it's not a big deal, but it is a big deal. Sin has consequences. And so you need to magnify the cost, whatever it is in your life, whatever it is you're struggling with, whether it's a, a sin or just some sort of a temptation of some sort of just something you know that's not healthy, magnify the cost. What could happen if you continue to pursue this? Will you lose your job? Will you lose your health? Will you lose your marriage? Will you go to jail possibly? Here, here's what we need to understand. Look at Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. We read, be assured your sin will find you out. Let me say that again. This is a great verse. If you're not memorizing scripture, here's a good one to memorize. Be assured, your sin will find you out. You may be fooling your spouse, your kids, your boss, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your church members, your pastor. You may be fooling everybody else, but you're not fooling God. He knows. And eventually, your sin will find you out, and it will come to light. And there will be consequences. And I want you to understand that even just one minute of sin can wreck your entire life. Somebody once said this, takes a lifetime to build a reputation and only a moment to destroy it. Be assured, your sin will find you out. So we've got to be ready. We've got to stand guard. We've got to move the line. We've got to magnify the cost. And the third thing is, I must predecide my escape plan. You know, even if you do move the line, and, and, and even if you are magnifying the cost, you're still human. Temptation is still going to come your way. So you better be ready for it. You better have your escape plan that you're going to follow once that temptation comes. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You are tempted in the same way that everyone else is tempted. But God can be trusted to not let you be tempted too much. And he will show you how to escape your temptations. Now, there's a great example of this in the Old Testament. His name is Joseph. I I shared a little bit of his story last week. But Joseph had decided that, you know what? No matter what comes my way, I'm going to live a life that's always honoring and pleasing to God. Including when it came to his sexual morals. And he had a plan ready for what happens if I'm tempted sexually. Sure enough, if you know the story, he gets sold by his brothers into slavery. And so now he's living off in Egypt. And he's in the house of a guy by the name of Potiphar. He's a servant. And so he's serving Potiphar. He's serving Potiphar's wife. He's serving everybody there in that household. And then all of a sudden, Mrs. Potiphar, or I've jokingly called her Mrs. Hotifer before, because she gets the hots for Joseph, starts putting the moves on him. Joseph's like, no, 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 no. 
<laughs> I'm honoring God here. Now, it had been easy for him to give in. Remember, he's a, he's a person living in a, in a foreign land. Nobody knows him. Nobody's going to know if he does this, if he just dips his toe in. But he says, no, no, no. I'm here to honor God, and I'm moving away from that line. And he has this escape plan because she starts putting the moves on hot and heavy with him, and she's just getting more and more pressure on him. He's like, no, no, no. And so he eventually says, here's my escape plan. If she starts to grab, I'm going to run. That was his escape plan. If she grabs, I run. And sure enough, one day she does that very thing. She's like, come on, just come to bed with me. And she grabs him by the coat. And you know what he does? He wiggles his way out of the coat and he runs. He flees. Because he knew that a good name and a good reputation with God was more important than a good coat. He can get another coat, but he can't get back his reputation. And so he flees the situation. And what I'm saying to you is you need to have an escape plan in much the same way that he did. He knew what it was, and then he executed on the plan. And so what's going to happen for you the next time that you're tempted with lust? How are you going to escape it? Or the next time you're tempted to lie or spend money that you shouldn't be spending? What, what is your escape plan for that? What's your escape plan for the next time that you're angry or that you're tempted to gossip or eat food that you're not supposed to eat or take drugs or alcohol? Basically, it's a, if this happens, then this is going to happen. Does that make sense? If this, then that. If I'm tempted in this way, I already have pre-decided, then this is my escape plan for getting out of it. Because remember, in the moment, emotions are likely to take over unless you have a plan for how to sort of suppress those emotions. And Paul says here that God's always going to provide you a way out. He's going to provide you a way out in the moment. So if you find yourself in a situation that, oh, I'm being tempted to cross the line, God always provides a way out in that moment. You do not have to give in to it. If you are a follower of Jesus, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. You have the power over sin now. You do not have to give in to that temptation, into that sin. You have power. There is an escape plan to get away from it. So it'll happen in the moment, but what I'm saying to you is it's even better to pre-decide beforehand how you're going to do it so that in the moment, you don't have to figure it out. You've already said, oh, I know what I'm supposed to do, and now I'm going to execute it. For him, for Joseph, it was, she grabs, I run. Here's how I put it on your outline. Why take the chance of resisting a temptation in the moment when I have the power to eliminate it today? Say it again. Why well, take the chance of resisting a temptation in the moment when I have the power to eliminate it today? Remember, the devil is coming for you. and You're not as strong as what you think that you are. So we have got to predetermine to move the line, to magnify the cost, and to have an escape plan. Value number one is I am ready. I am ready. So I want you to Go home, and I want you to pray about this. I want you to think about this. How can I be ready for the trials and temptations and struggles that are going to come my way? What is the plan that I have in order to escape those things? Remember, when your values are clear, then your decisions become so much easier. So let's go home and pre-decide. I am ready. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you for just your word talks about everything in life that we'll ever encounter, including how to escape temptation. And so there's examples and there's encouragement. Help us now to live according to your word. Help us not live according to our flesh. Help us not live according to our emotions because we know that our flesh is weak and we know that our emotions will give in. Lord, help us to live by the power of your spirit. But even then, to allow your spirit to work in our lives now before we even get into those tempting situations so that we find ourselves in those situations even less. Help us to, to move away from that line. Help us to, to magnify the cost so that when temptation comes, we're like, ooh, that's gross. 
Because here's what could happen if, if I would pursue that. Lord, help us always to have that escape plan that if we do get close to the line and we realize it, that we're like, oh, here's my way to get out. God, you have promised according to your word that you always provide that way out. So thank you for that. Help us now to be obedient to take that path that you give us then. Jesus, we thank you so much that you make us aware of just how um, evil and twisted and perverted Satan is that he does want to kill and steal and destroy from us. Thank you that you came and you overcame Satan. You over, overcame sin. Not just so that we could have the forgiveness of sin, but so we can have the power over sin as well. So help us now to walk according to that power that you've given us. The power of your spirit that lives inside of us. Help us to be obedient each and every day and each and every step of the way. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.